Okay, hello. Uh, so I'm not used to holding one of these similarly, so if I do do anything weird, just tell me and I'll try and bring it back so you can hear me. Um, okay, so yep, my name's Gareth Harbord. I work for the Metropolitan Police, yeah, and I am staff only, no arresting powers, so no, no fear there. Um, so I head up the video data recovery unit for um, the Metropolitan Police video forensics lab. Uh, I started off in around 2005 doing various broadcast jobs and around nine years ago I moved over to forensics because I fancied a bit of a challenge and doing something a bit different. Um, so this talk today is going to be around exploring some of the different processes we use to uh, take images and preserve their quality whilst processing them. Um, and we're also going to look at some of the limitations that we face during that processing and some of the strategies we involve to mitigate that. So uh, I'm going to start with a cheesy intro and just introduce what forensics is in this context. So we're looking at forensic science, so we're applying scientific principles, techniques, um, and techniques whilst collecting, examining, and analysing evidence. So. The, the gist of it is that your results have to be what we call reliable, repeatable, and verifiable. So we're looking at, can we trust the results? Will the same test, so if I do a test and I do it again, is it going to get the same result? Or is it just a complete fluke? In which case, perhaps not a very valid test. And can the results be checked? So if I give them to a colleague, will they get the same results as well? Or is it some quirk that I'm doing that I'm not aware of? Um, okay, so what we're going to try and cover today is the end state. So what's the goal? What's the point of doing our work? What are we, what are we trying to achieve? Uh, we're going to look at what we do in the lab, uh, the different services. The, uh, we're going to look at diversity of source, so by far our biggest challenge, which is just all the different formats we come across. Uh, we're going to look at acquisition, so how we, how we actually extract the data from the various devices we encounter how we then ingest it and get it into a workable state, uh, compilation, what, how we actually, what we do, how we put it together, how we conform it to a useful broadcast, well, not broadcast, but courtroom format, and uh, the, the presentation of actually getting it into the courtroom and, and playing it back in a successful way. So uh, we'll start with the end state, so what are, we, what are we doing? So one of the things we might be looking at is, is live intelligence. So getting something in, getting it to play back, getting an immediate result. So if video is in our lab, it's because no one else has been able to play it. Uh, we'll, we'll go into a bit more depth on the levels that we sort of go through later. But the example here is obviously, let's say Darth Vader's gone missing and we're trying to find him. An officer might be bringing a giant sack of videos and we'll be looking for all those videos, trying to get them all to play back and different formats, different things you're encountering. So. Again, I'll, I'll go into the details later. Uh, then there's evidence, getting it into court, getting it in front of a jury, making it playable. One of the biggest requests is, can we have that in a playable format? Same as in broadcast, nobody knows what that really means, so we have to try and define it for them. Um, and then you get this a lot. You get lots of uh, infrared cameras that have spider webs growing on them. <laughs> and you'd spend about 20 hours trying to get something to work, and then you go, that's, that's what it was all for. Um, very, very, very common. Uh, right, so here's an overview of some of the services we provide within the lab. So uh, we do downloads and data recovery, which is the team I head up. The court compilation, presentation in court, uh, enhancement, and uh, comparison. So uh, downloads and data recovery. So we're looking at, there's kind of two tiers of this. There's physical damage, so is, you know, as a, if a drive comes in with a big hammer mold for it, it's probably not going to be anything we can do with it. If um, there are some situations where we can do work with physical damage, I generally give that to a different team because it's, it's a whole world in itself. I tend to deal with the sort of the, the, the logical data side of corruption and, and uh, repair. Um, so we're so uh, you've got court compilation and presentation. So this is taking lots of different sources and getting them onto a timeline, getting them edited, and putting them into a format that, that goes to court. So um, we're talking about possibly highlighting the video as well. 
that can be a big challenge with CCTV because of the variable frame rates we encounter. So if you get very low frame rate, uh, arrow interpolation can be extremely problematic. So sometimes you have to basically keyframe every single frame in order to put highlighting on it. Otherwise, you get this horrible thing where you get an arrow and it'll just drift across the still, which is very distracting. Um, I had a friend recently who's still in broadcast and he had to work on one of these um, kind of camera type CCTV shows and I just gloated so much because he was just complaining every day. Um, and then uh, we also get a lot of complex cases. So like I said before, you it's quite common for an editor in a lab to have um, maybe like 40 different exhibits to work from and each of them will be potentially in a different format. So a lot of work goes into getting that into a position where it can go to court. Okay, so uh, the next strand we do is enhancement. So obviously you know, there's this whole mad CSI people in mirrors through prisms and all sorts of madness. And that's nonsense, obviously. That There are a few tricks we can do. There's um, a lot of it's been stolen from astronomy. So we've got uh, blind deconvolution, which is kind of effectively deblurring an image. Sometimes if you've got the right sort of smear and the right motion, you can correct for that. Obviously not to extremes, but to small amounts. Um, and then we've got the other one, which is uh, frame averaging, where you can take I mean, this is a terrible example I cooked up in about five minutes the other day. But, um, so you take multiple images of the same thing or a very low resolution and you effectively line them up over each other and average them. You can do it in Photoshop. Uh, it's not the best tool for it, but you can. Um, and if you're lucky, you'll get a slightly sort of clearer, at least denoised image. Whether you'll get more resolution or not is going to depend on your imagery. Uh, and we've got comparison. Um, so, yeah, so taking a reference image and then looking at the reference image compared to a question source, it's quite a big area in itself, so I'm not going to go into major detail, otherwise I'll just get it all wrong, but the, um, the idea is that you're looking at similarities in feature detail, so, you know, you're looking at Father Christmas's nose there, and then you're looking at him in the CCTV image, I mean, you can't see it, so you can't compare it, obviously, but if you could see it, you'd be comparing the shape and the Width, breadth, and I think the idea is you look at each feature separately, and a lot, a lot of work goes into trying to reduce the bias because obviously it's a very subjective field how we perceive faces. So uh, a lot of the work goes into trying to to minimise the biasing that goes on. Um, so that's that's the main three strands we're sort of looking at there. Um, so I'll go move on. Um, biggest problem we have by far is just the diversity of the, so many different formats out there. Uh, so we've got CCTV systems. Uh, CCTV systems are, I mean, digital systems have been going since the early 2000s, and unfortunately some of them are still in situ. Um, not exaggerating at all, we still get disks from like 2005 coming in. Um, and they have often been spinning since then, so quite often you, you sort of finally turn them off and then they never power back up again when they come to us. Uh, we've got the, the advent of IP cameras now. IP cameras are complicating things even more because now you've got a network recorder which works with it, so you, you've got this added element of kind of network infrastructure going on. So now instead of just having a timestamp in your DVR, you've potentially got a timestamp in your camera, a timestamp in your other camera, a timestamp in your network video recorder, and um, if you're unlucky, they might all be synchronizing separately at random intervals to different clocks around the world as well. So all sorts of madness can go on with that. Um, and the other problem is they all, there is absolutely no standardization. They might use different codecs. They will use different export formats. Um, they will be wrapping multiple cameras potentially into the same file. And that will require a proprietary player in order to play it back on top of that. Absolute myriad of madness. Uh, quite fun to work with, though. So uh, then we've got mobile devices. These come with their own problems. I mean, on the whole, mobiles aren't too bad to work with, but you've got uh, non-conformant bitstream issues are quite prevalent. So uh, we had a big problem a few years ago with uh, full range and limited range YUV. And as much as a lot of the manufacturers, and probably still with professional cameras, actually, as well, don't 
label that polar their bitstream correctly so the tools pick them up try and do a, a color space conversion and just clip out all the blacks because they think they're working in the limited range even though they're full or sometimes vice versa um, also now they've introduced variable frame rates to compensate for low shutters for, sorry for low light so they'll dip the frame rate when it goes to a low light condition that can be very problematic i think the editing equipment's sort of slowly catching up with variable frame rates but it's still not great for us uh, and then you've also got shaky images you have to deal with stabilization you have to deal with the sort of horrible multiple warping you can get you've got twist back and forth up and down general shake um, and also <clears throat> one of the biggest problems we get with mobile phone footage is Lots of people think it's absolutely acceptable to deliver it by WhatsApp, which is <laughs> massively, yeah, exactly, you know what I'm talking about. So, um, yeah, it's not great. Email, WhatsApp, Facebook, it, it gets to us all sorts of ways. And, um, and one of the latest things we've got now is that um, since H.265 has been introduced under the hood in a lot of phones, some of them when you try and download the clip, the file system will present you a file and it will look like that's exactly what the file is. But you'll drag it off and it will live under the hood transcode it back to being H.264, which can be very problematic because, you know, if you, uh, forensically you want access to the original. Uh, right, so uh, the other one that's new is dashboard cameras. Millions of these, they're constantly running, especially in like commercial vehicles, absolutely hammering the SD card in them. It was never intended to be a rolling video DVR recording unit. Uh, some of them will have uh, double view, so they'll be muxing the cameras together. You'll get a file and it's both cameras woven together. Uh, they have their own sort of, you know, proprietary metadata as well, so GPS location and everything else, but they'll, they'll weave it in in whatever way they seem fit. Um, <clears throat> can be very useful, and obviously you get some good evidential quality, but the other problem with with these is, okay, let's say you've got a, a car crash or something. The car crashes, it's writing an MP4, all the move atom for anyone who's dealt with MP4, so all the indexing is in the RAM and the car crashes and then that never gets written, so you've got a <laughs> massive bunch of orphan frames with nowhere to get them back, so that's also loads of fun. <clears throat> uh, okay, so what do we use to deal with all this? So diagnostic tools, FF Probe, Exif tool, Media info, these are all great starting points. Um, I generally go straight in for the hex a lot of the time, but these, these are great for trying to work out what you're dealing with. Uh, we also still get legacy formats too. We, we've literally had this week Ematic that we are trying to figure out how to bake. Um, that is not even made up, so uh, we've got that. We also still quite regularly get VHSs except they're not normal VHSs, the VHS is where they've multiplexed eight different cameras onto them using proprietary time codes in the uh, vertical time code at the top. So they use that as a code, so we have to have a proprietary system from back in, you know, that we've, we've got a bank of these things that we've harvested, so you can still pull the cameras apart, but they can be very fun. And then you also get uh, the old systems which also use the, I think it's like the longitudinal audio track, which is quite unusual to use for the VHS as a third audio recording. So there's, anyway, if, if they can crowbar stuff on there, they will. That's the, the rule of thumb. If it can be done, you'll probably encounter it at some point. So uh, in terms of our general challenges, we're looking at proprietary codecs, proprietary uh, media containers. Not all codecs are proprietary. Obviously, there's still a lot of H.264 moving more into H.265, but then we do still get a lot of weird old like tweak codecs where it might have been a bit H.264 like, but they've changed something just to make it their own. Um, proprietary replay software and unpredictable data integrity. So it's, when you've got a format you've never seen before, it's very hard to know if it's actually correct or not, or if there's something already damaged inherently about it. Okay, so Next, we could talk a bit about the, the amount of quantity we're dealing with as well. So, you know, if you get a two terabyte drive, there used to be this magic idea that all CCTV systems should hold 28 days of recordings. That has changed a bit now that there's everything from SIF to 4K in the CCTV world. But typically going back to what that would have been, two terabyte disc, 28 days, so eight cameras, we're talking about 5,000 hours per disc that comes in. Now, obviously, you can't convert all of that, so you have to target what you're looking at. But this whole concept of an HD recording sort of soon falls apart because 
once you sort of look at what you can actually achieve with that sort of bit rate is not HD at all. So you might find an HD, you know, unit's being sold as HD, but you can't achieve anything like that with the bit rate you're only able to achieve with your storage. Once you start multiplexing cameras together, um, you know, ideally you're looking at sort of 2000 K ish, that sort of finger in the air transcode I did the other day, but you don't get that very often. You get, you get sort of video, generally speaking, video is more down near the 200 sort of mark. Uh, so yet yeah, you can get any of these re re I can't say resolutions. Yeah, resolutions, um, maybe not QCIF very often, but you do get CIF quite frequently. You'll get very odd video where they've taken an analog camera and captured half the field, so you've got half height vertically. So uh, 704 by 288 used to be quite common, uh, but now you, you get anything up to 4K, so it's a real, real variety, which does make the editing side a bit of a challenge when you're trying to get those to all sit nicely with each other. Um, so what do we do? We have to target relevant data because obviously we can't deal with 5,000 hours of processing. Can't process everything. Uh, we, can, we do clone drives when we're working on them. It, it depends on the sort of job. We, sometimes we do it by exception, sometimes we don't. It depends on what, what sort of level you're working at it with. Uh, the quality of the source varies and DVRs, are, uh, the digital recording systems themselves are quite problematic because they're constantly overwriting. So the oldest footage is constantly being overwritten by the newest footage. So that means that you only have a quite a limited amount of time in order to actually go and get that footage off the system. Um, so right, moving on to acquisition. So we deal with kind of three sort of levels within the Met. We send the officers to try and get it first. If they can't, they'll bring the, the Vido, who are kind of technically trained officers. And then if they can't do it, they bring it to us and we sort of deal with about the top 5% of the, the toughest jobs. So generally, if it's come to us, there's a good chance it's going to be quite challenging. Um, hundreds of proprietary file systems as well. So this is the other problem you get with DVRs, is that the file systems, the hard drives come on are not FAT32 or NTFS. They are just made up file systems dealt to cope with all the frames being mucked together. So generally quite minimal file system, but absolute nonsense for plugging into a PC because the PC will not be able to recognize it whatsoever. It thinks it's a blank disk. And then a lot of my time is spent reverse engineering these made up file systems. Um, there, there are some dedicated extraction tools for the hard disks, but they're quite few and far between and they're quite young products. So they're, they're getting there, but they're not there yet. And it's impossible because they'll never keep up with all the new units that come to market. Okay, so yeah, as you said, there's no format standardization. Generally, we have to work on the live device, certainly initial extraction because you're dealing with these DVRs that are the only way of getting the footage out unless you try and you know, do a full reverse engineer on the DVR on the hard disk, which is not practical for most jobs. <coughs> because, you, know, you just run out of time and money if you try to do it for every single one. <coughs> Sorry, for every single one. So. Uh, when you deal with a device, you have to disable the overwrite so it stops killing the oldest footage. And then you have to look at native or rewrapped. So do you want an AVI? If it can produce an AVI, there's an inherent risk. It might try and transcode it, which again, you don't want. You want native footage. Or you go with the native uh, weird format that it decides to give you. So .dvr, .dav, .whatever. So there's, there's everything and anything. And they don't mean anything either. There's a lot of files that say they're .mp4 and they're just their own totally made up format, <laughs> just to really, you know, with you. So, um, and then the other, so the biggest question we get when, food, when a system comes in is, is, is it there? Is it actually worth doing all this work? Um, okay, so we get a lot of legacy hardware as well. So you get a DVR, like I was saying before, from 2005, there's a very good chance that any modern peripherals aren't gonna work with it. So it's quite important to keep legacy equipment as well in order to be able to deal with that. So again, we, we try and harvest what we can. Um, so small old USB sticks, and generally it's best to keep them nearby, otherwise they, they just disappear generally. Uh, okay, so broken ones. So what have we got here? So uh, most of the content we get is broken in the first place. So we have to do a bit of reverse engineering. So um, because other people are getting better at because generally I think it's fair to say that people are getting more used to dealing with DVRs, the things we do get are the really problematic ones now. So um, 
or the tips for working with them. Well, first thing, we have to use uh, right blockers when we deal with all of our uh, evidence so that we try not to do anything harmful on the originals. So this is quite important. It's the idea of data preservation. You right block, we retain the originals so that the court can always see the originals. So if we, are, we are processing. We don't want someone to turn around and say, look what you've done, you've changed everything irreparably. Well, no, we keep everything as it was. So you can always see what was there if you can get it to work anyway. Um, and we make sure we take lots and lots of notes, lots of obsessive long notes with paginated pages and it would make your brain fall out if you could see some of it. But um, right, what do we do? Acquisition. So this is the hex bit. I'll try not to do too much of this, but there's a, a little bit. Uh, so how do we, how do I sort of proceed when I'm doing a data rec? Well, I will try and look for a hex reader because generally it's the easiest way to identify what you've got in front of you. So um, a lot of the time, I'm saved by the, the, I don't know if you can see the start codes there, the 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 6, 7 that's highlighted in blue, but generally you get that before an iframe if you're lucky. Not always, and that's that's where I look at H264 there. Uh, so I usually use that as a way of identifying what's coming up. And then if you're lucky, you can sort of see in yellow here, you've got this high ad marker. Um, and then what I'll do is normally sample 30, 40 bytes before each frame that's occurring, sample them, and then lay out that metadata. And once you start doing it, you can actually sort of start to see there, there's a bit of pattern forming in the data. Just through being me, I've been able to sort of get used to doing this now, so I can start to see, well, there's a field that sort of varies in a certain way. It's probably a size number. There's a static set of bytes. There's a good chance that's a camera number. And you, after a bit of experience, you start to see patterns, and I use that to try and build up an idea of the way the data is structured. Once I've got that built up, I try and start testing frames. So I'll extract an iframe, throw it for FFmpeg, decode it as a PNG or a JPEG, have a look. And if you're really lucky, there'll be some on-screen display info so you can start confirming your thoughts. So if I find something that I think is a time code I recognize, confirm it against the OSD the on-screen display that is, and then if you're lucky, you, you get a bit further with, with working out what it is. Once I've done that, you just take loads of notes. Obviously not like this. I don't go and do a massive diagram of every job I work on. I go insane. This is just for the demo, but um, most of it I just write in a big notepad plus plus document and then forget about it. Um, I should find, I need to find a better way to record all the knowledge because it's <laughs> really quite hard. But anyway, so that's the thing. Um, so yeah, you do things like work out, is it the Endianness, is it little Endian or big Endian? So does it just to do with the way the bytes are ordered? Um, and you can generally do that by just trying to work out frame sizes and then you confirm the frame size against the bytes. It's just a very backwards and forth process and just lots of, lots of sort of checking your results. Uh, once you've done that, then the other thing we get, as I mentioned before about the MP4s where the move, uh, the, the bit where the frames are indexed disappears, th this is something I working on at the moment as well, and not this specific one, but very similar. And again, you just have to end up finding tricks to work your way through the stream and work out any quirks that give you clues. This is the madness that is AVI, more fields than anyone ever needed or asked for. Uh, the problem with this file was like such an easy fix. It was just missing, I think it was the total number of frames and the size of the index, which was the list size. You fix that and jobs are good and then it will play back. But it was just a, one of those random ones where a very small tweak to a massive amount of data fixed it. So like I said before, first thing to do is find the footage. Is it there? If you, you, know, if you can't work out if it's there, there's not much else you can do really. Um, so you identify a marker, identify the timestamp format. Then I've got a bit of code that if it's a timestamp I recognize, I can put the marker in say, right, I know the timestamp is uh, five bytes on from the marker, and it will scan through the whole disk and create a human-readable set of timestamps as a big giant CSV file. Last time I did that, it was a four terabyte drive, and it generated a 27 gigabyte CSV file. <laughs> so that was, that was, that was great. Um, and nothing would open it, um, which was not useful. So. What I found was actually uh, CMD is quite good. There's like all the old tools seem to work quite well. There's a tool in there called Find. I just typed in the dates I wanted and piped it back out to another text file and it 
it did the job quite well actually. So uh, that, that was good. And then once you've got, once you can, I mean, you have to filter down because 27 gigs is madness. But if you can do it, then you can start to look at the output you're interested in and you can look at the structure of the disk. And if you're lucky, you might see a 50 meg chunk for camera one, a 50 meg chunk for camera two and so on, and, and it will give you a bit of a, an idea, and then you can look at it in more detail and sort of refine your idea of how it's working. If you're really unlucky, it'll be splitting packets across chunks. So if you get half a frame in one chunk and half a frame in another chunk, that can be nightmarish, but you, you just sort of deal with it as it comes. Uh, and, then, and then you write some code. So once you've got an idea of, of the actual structure, generally I'll have to write something, or you see sharp, I, inherited all my code from uh, the previous guy who did my job, so I've just kept using that. I've learned to code on the job, and sort of here we are, and sort of get by with what I know, but I don't know much. So it's sort of, it gets me through, but I couldn't do anything useful, like make a proper program, I think. Um, so then once, what I do generally is I'll split the raw frames out, uh, like I say, with HT64, hopefully, and then just pipe them for FFmpeg, and wrap them into an MP4 or an AVI. And once we've got it like that, then we can start to think about putting it into a different tool. Um, luckily, most of what we get, the CCTV side of things, doesn't have audio. If you've got audio, that gets a lot harder because then you have to split two streams out and then think about synchronizing it back up. And then when you get into variable packet sizes, oh, I've got one with AIC at the moment, it's an absolute nightmare. Uh, and then we move on to ingest. So we'll move away from data recovery. So no more, I think it's hex free from now on. So the code of Earth is sort of safe now. Uh, so, okay, so this is just a very small screenshot of some of the many, many horrible players we've got. Um, yeah, like this, and, and I don't know what that means, and then you've got one like that, and seven cameras, and they're all going to try and play at the same time, and that one that you can't scale, and that one that will start in the weirdest size and never give you half the cameras, and it will crash if you press the button down there, and it goes on and on and on, and they're very difficult to work with. Um, so. They're all very OED syncretic. None of them work very well. They're very buggy programs as well. They were designed for one build on one machine in one lab ever with absolutely no thought going into them being put across different platforms or being used on different operating systems. They're not updated. They just sort of shot into the ether and forgotten about forever. Um, and then if you're looking at the really old ones, they'll come with direct show codecs and they will just junk your system to death. So, yeah, it's fun, it's fun. I like my job. Um, so, and then if you're looking at the, the really older ones, they'll use these weird codecs. Um, Analog Devices did a, the ADV601 chip, which was a wavelet-based chip that exists in a few DVRs. If you ever see a CCTV file with a .601 extension, recoil in horror and cower. Um, GeoVision, they had like a whole bank of GMP4 and GX264 and all sorts of things. Well, they just tweaked it a little bit and it wasn't quite the same codec anymore. Um, there was a French manufacturer that had the Smack M, which is not the same as the Smacker codec that was used for the point and click games in the 90s. This is a different Smack M because um, we needed to. So. Um, and they're, they're just all massively difficult to transcode. You're very unlikely to do it. We, we did have a bit of luck with ADV601 because they managed to, pro, to put their like Windows 95 era binary on, on the internet and I managed to get someone to compile it. It was, it was interesting. So um, yeah, so we have to screen capture a lot of what we get. That's the only way to deal with that sort of stuff. When it's wrapped in a player that was only working on a version of Windows from 2010 or 15 years ago, then. We play the proprietary player back. If we're lucky, we try and get it to scale at 100%. That's quite difficult because it's very hard to tell, especially on modern screens where the, the resolution sizes are so much more variable than for when these players were actually designed, but it's probably going to be SVGA. Um, you've got to render it on the desktop, which means you're already color, color space converting to RGB, so there's a good chance you're going to lose some detail in that conversion. You screen grab, we capture as raw RGB. You know, you've got the limitations of that being done in real time. But it's a simple process. It's quite good. You don't need too much technical knowledge to screen capture. You hit go, hit record. Um, and then if you're lucky, sometimes the um, native players will play an OSD that's only encoded in the metadata. So they'll, they'll overlay it themselves rather than um, it being burnt into the actual image. 
So uh, the cons, like I said, you've got color space conversion, higher likelihood of dropping frames, especially when you're trying to capture at raw RGB. Uh, you've got potential scaling issues of the players doing scaling under the hood. Uh, also, sometimes the players can crop the edges as well, which can be problematic. Uh, the capture is going to be real time, so if you've got a long piece of footage to capture, which generally we try and avoid, it can be a problem. And uh, it requires transcoding to um, conform the frame rates and maybe the resolution and reduce the data size because it's raw. So um, it's just the workflow. So at the moment, we're going to, I think we just moved over to ProRes. We were trying to use lossless H.264. We keep going back and forth on what the best sort of workflow is. But we're trying this again at the moment. Um, so transcoding. Um, transcoding is quite useful, obviously. We can take the original file, ideally conform it for the timeline, but if you're lucky, you can maintain the color space by staying in the YUV zone uh, range. Uh, and you're less likely to crop image edges. It can be better with interlaced sources. I mean, that's debatable. It depends on the interlaced source. Um, and it's faster than real time, and you don't have to deal with a weird executable that could be doing all sorts of changes to your system that are undesirable. Um, the cons are not all formats are compatible, so you can try and chuck a .dvr file through FFmpeg. It might work. It might be full of junk start codes, like I was saying with the 001s before, because manufacturers think, hey, we don't care, we're not running a usual player. We'll put as many 001s in as we can, and FFmpeg will see them and then go, ah, and you know, it's not very good. So um, you've got that. You've got the OSD overlays. If it is being generated by the proprietary player, that's not going to be there anymore. It depends how much you're wedded to that. I generally prefer quality over the time code, but it, it depends on the, your needs for the job. Uh, you've got unpredictable behavior. So again, you might throw it through. It might start doing something odd like dropping frames, but you can't always tell if you've not put it through a proprietary player in the first place. So we generally go with a dual tooling approach where we'll try and watch it back in the player and the transcoded version to, to get a bit of a idea of, of what could or could not be going wrong. And the other problem is probably the most common is the timing gets lost. So if you put your .ddr file through FFmpeg, it can't read any of the timing from the wrapper, and it will just try and play the H.264 frames in one big burst. Um, but you can compensate for that. It just means watching it back and trying to either calculate the time through the OSD or taking a guess, which you know is not ideal with evidence, but you just have to because that's the only option you've got. Um, so then the other one we do is rewrapping. So rewrapping is good because you take it and put it into a container without doing any transcoding, so no actual change under the hood, um, which is quite good for enhancement because then you can work with the raw frames without doing any changes at all. Um, and if you're lucky, your enhancement tool does work in YUV, so <laughs> that can be a problem as well. Uh, okay, so sometimes the rewrapping is also useful as a pre-step to transcoding. So if you need to get it in, if you want to transcode it in something like Adobe Media Encoder rather than FFmpeg, it might help to rewrap it first because Media Encoder is probably not going to accept quite a lot of formats. Um, and you can, the other good thing for rewrapping is time code repair. So if your time code is, is wrong for whatever reason, like I said before, with the H.264 frames flying through, you can use FFmpeg as a way of, or yeah, FFmpeg generally is what I use, um, as a way of fixing that. Uh, so, like I say, for ingest, we're currently using ProRes HQ. We can form to a 30 frame a second timeline, and we scale everything up to 1920 by 1080. We made that decision because that's generally what things are being viewed upon now in the courtrooms. Not always and not everywhere, but that's generally the way it seems to be going. So it's about trying to stay current with the end product so we can reduce as much uncertainty between the video and the output. Um, and we are distributing as an MP4 um, that's HT64 at the moment. Um, the problems we get with that is uh, chapter markers. We used to quite like using as ways of navigating the stream. Chapter markers are sort of dying out as a thing that gets used in most players now. Um, and the other problem has been the movement on that note as well, the movement away from the sort of DVD menuing type system in general. So now we just distribute a big MP4, which is not as good as it used to be. But there are, there are ways around that. We did experiment with browser replay, but we found it was too unreliable in general 
not completely unreliable, but as a medium for showing evidence, it wasn't the best idea because you couldn't necessarily predict frames, uh, frame loss or what platform the browser would be on. Um, so the other step on from that is when it gets to the courtroom, the replay systems can be quite problematic. So um, you get uh, wireless streaming systems, which I'm not allowed to name, but um, dongles, USB 2 dongles that you plug into your machine, and it streams it to a receiver on the other end. Your CPU is obliged to do most of the encoding before it goes out of your USB 2, so you're live re-encoding to H.264, blocks, drop frames, just rubbish. Um, so all of the work I've just described is not always for anything when it gets to the actual courtroom. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, no, uh, right, so we do have a presentation team in-house who try and mitigate a lot of that. So they've got their own equipment that they'll give to officers and it's like an all-in-one presentation system for showing off PDFs and videos and documents and getting it all in one place. Um, and they also will educate the officers to try and get them to be able to use that best. It's kind of like an iTunes for sort of video playback but with other types of um, other, other mediums as well. Um, all right. Oh, there we are. I'm done. There we go.